What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. Tonight, we're talking about Devs, Episode 2. And this will be a lot of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the episode yet, do that and then watch this video. I'm Gil, and I'm talking to my brother, Alun. Yo. With that, let's jump into tonight's episode. Alun, you and I both loved Episode 1 of this series, and we were worried. Are we still going to like it after Episode 2? So how are you feeling about the show after having seen the second episode? Top level. I still like it, but I did like Episode 1 a little bit better. Got it. I uh, Yeah, I think I mostly agree. I loved it after, after Episode 1, and I still love it. Maybe a few minor quibbles, but overall... Loving the show, and I can't wait for episode three, which, by the way, comes out in about six hours because uh, they get released at 6 a.m., it sounds like. So uh, anyway, let's just jump right into episode two. So probably the biggest reveal of this episode is we saw what's in the box. At least we saw a little bit of what devs, what the devs team is doing. So we see a sort of TV screen, a blurry image. For a second, I thought I saw an arm, and I figured that's all we're going to see this episode. And then it started to solidify into an image of somebody on a cross, perhaps uh, Jesus. They did say it was about 2,000 years ago we were looking at. They referred to it as backwards projection. And uh, yeah, it looks like we saw the past. This is a pretty shocking revelation. Uh, Stuart, the guy that you were a big fan of last episode, you said that you hope we see more of this guy, the guy who smiled at Sergey. So you yep. got your wish. He was a more prominent character in this episode. He's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> so Forrest is disappointed. We got a blurry image of potentially Jesus on a cross. Forrest is disappointed. Stewart is shocked at his disappointment. He says, this is a miracle. We should be bathing in champagne. Forrest says, it's not a miracle, but it needs to be. And he essentially says, this is binary. We either achieve perfect success or we don't. So I'm assuming that when he says success, he doesn't just mean a clearer image. I'm assuming he means something more than that. So Alon, first off, what was your reaction to, to seeing that image on the screen? And second, any theories on what success looks like? What does Forrest hope to achieve here that they haven't yet achieved? My guess is that success means not only being able to see the past, but to be able to alter, alter it. I think it, what I find kind of funny is Forrest has this stance where you're not really supposed to have these human emotions, but he clearly still really cares for his deceased daughter. My theory is that he wants the ability to go back in time through this technology and save his daughter. Yeah. But which kind of goes against his current principles. Right. So he's not very disciplined. (laughs) I gotta say. No, for somebody who is so anti-emotion, he may be the most emotional guy in the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, that, so your interpretation was my first read as well. I assumed you're looking at the past. That's not good enough. They want the ability to change the past. But because that was our first inclination, that makes me think it's wrong. And I also have a feeling they used the word projection. They called it a backward projection, which made me wonder... Can you do a forward projection, a forward projection, and look into the future? And then that made me wonder: Are we really seeing the past, or are we seeing a recreation of the past? Because I thought back to episode one, where they were predicting the movements of an organism, and I don't think they were looking into the future. I think they were taking all the variables, and because the world is predetermined, if you know all the current variables, you can predict the future. So extending from that, I hear the word projection, I think guess. So when they call this a backwards projection, it makes me wonder, do they just have a super quantum computer that can look at all the variables in the world right now, can look at all of the cells and essentially follow their project their trajectory into the past and recreate the past? Saying if we look at everything as it is today, where everything came from, we can create a pretty good image of the past. And if that's what they're doing, you wouldn't be able to change the past because you're not 
you're not actually looking at the past. You're looking at a recreation of it. Is a theory I have based off of hearing the word projection. That's a good point and would be more in line with what we've seen so far. Yeah. I have a feeling that's going to be clear. At one point, someone's going to say, we can see into the past. And then Forrest is going to say, no, that's impossible. You're seeing a projection of the past. Uh, oh, good side impression, note, man. Thank you. Thank you. Every once in a while, <laughs> I get one of those uh, good impressions in there. <laughs> Uh, as an aside, it's kind of funny. You and I, a few weeks ago, I think a week or two ago, I was telling you about a conspiracy theory. Uh, maybe I wasn't talking. I was talking to somebody about a conspiracy theory where the church has something called a chronovisor, basically a TV that lets them see anything from the past at any time. So they can look at the dinosaurs. They can look at you, you know, two days ago. Did you say they have coronavirus? No. <laughs> The chronovisor. <laughs> I see how you could make that mistake. <laughs> so I have a feeling that Alex Garland heard that uh, conspiracy theory. The idea got in his head and he thought about it and he thought, what would that be like? How do I make that more scientific? And I wonder if that's the germ of the idea that got him here. Why do you think Katie, that's the blonde girl that works with Forrest, why do you think she got annoyed at Stuart's use of the word baby? He kept calling the, the code baby. He'd say, yeah, baby. Yeah, don't call it baby. Oh, I guess she just doesn't like him not taking it seriously enough, perhaps. It could be that. I want, It felt very, I don't know if serious is the right word, but she seemed to really take issue with it. It made me wonder if it's something... I feel like Alex Garland keeps injecting emotion into every aspect of this show. So you can't just have a screen that lets you see the past. You have a screen that lets you see the past. You add on to that a father who's lost his daughter and he uses that to, to uh, wallow in that tragedy. So something as simple as Katie taking issue with the use of the word baby. What if she had somebody in her life Baby was a nickname she used, either a son or a daughter, or maybe a husband. She used to call him Baby, and so the word reminds her of that. I think I've been, I'm watching this show through the filter of there's always some emotional aspect to everything. So I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but that's where my mind went. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. And then uh, Forrest uses the machine, like you referenced, to look at his daughter and it's one funny thing is he pressed like two or three buttons on that screen and then it pulled up an image of his daughter. And I just wonder, how does this machine work? Like, what did he type in? Because he had to specify the coordinates, right, of where they're looking. He had to specify the time. And so how does it take, it's like a couple swipes and you're, you're from Jesus. Okay, now you're looking at your daughter. Unless it was a preset, like on a radio. Maybe there's some sort of advanced bluetooth technology where he can connect it to his own brain it could be it could be yeah it could be that it uh, has something to do with imagine what you want to see and then the machine will bring it into into clarity and, and how does the machine know what camera angle to use <laughs> right a lot of questions and knowing <laughs> alex garland i bet at least some of them will be explored uh last thought i had on this scene is and i've harped on this five times already, but Alex keeps injecting emotional elements into everything. Forrest, like we said, it seems to be a very emotional person, and I have a feeling that is going to be a strong source of tension between him and Katie. We saw moments of that in the previous episode where she seems to be doing a much better job of shutting down her emotions than he is, and that makes me think that something's going to happen where he either commit some sort of a betrayal. Maybe he'll want to help Lily at some point. Uh, but I have a feeling that is going to be some source of tension between him and Katie. But just a prediction. Any other thoughts on what we saw of Stuart, the devs, or, or anything else in that box? No. <laughs> well, moving on, uh, Lily meets Sergey's boss, Anton. And uh, first off, when she, when she tried putting in another code, I was like, what are you doing? You only have two more guesses. 
And uh, I thought that was nuts that she tried again. Um, but once they actually cracked the code and got in and she uh, eventually went to go meet Sergey, I thought he did a great job of convincing her or he made a great pitch to try and get her to work for him. But by the end of it, I was like, I want to work for him. And I really <laughs> thought she was going to go for it. Um, so I thought they did a good job of, of selling that and making you... I At least I bought that she would struggle with that decision. Because mm-hmm. on the surface, should I go work for the Russian government after I suspect my boyfriend was just killed for doing exactly that? You would say, of course I'm not going to do that. I think they did a good job of selling me that there is a decision to be made there. Maybe you would want to do it. And he did it by appealing to her emotionally. If you're not satisfied with this answer, you want to know more about what happened to Sergey, then you want to work for me. Yeah, I loved his how he convinced her too. He's like, my first thought would be murder. Like, right? And he said, just an insight into his world. Murdered. What about what did you say about his world? I love that. Oh, I, I said the way he he doesn't even question it. He's like, I if it were me, I would know that he was murdered. I was saying that that gives a little insight into his world and what he the kinds of things he deals with. <laughs> right, right. The fact that you even need to have this is my rule of thumb. A friend of mine commits suicide. I, first thing I do is I assume it's murder. The fact that you need <laughs> to have that rule of thumb says something about what you're dealing with in your, in your daily <laughs> basis. <laughs> <laughs> also, you and I, even in episode one, we were praising this show and its approach to mystery, where it doesn't drag it out. It doesn't have mystery for the sake of mystery. So they just casually reveal Kenton has been watching this entire conversation. And Kenton's kind of the muscle that works for Forrest, the guy who killed Sergey. So immediately you're worried for Lily. He saw the whole thing. So he's got to take out Lily, right? to stop her from taking on the Sergei role. But he doesn't take that approach. Instead, he approaches Anton, Sergei's boss, in the parking garage. And basically the way this scene goes is Kenton tries to appeal to Sergei on an emotional, or Kenton tries to appeal to Anton on an emotional level. Come on, Lily's a nice girl. She's a smart girl. Leave her out of this. Why don't you just walk away? Professional courtesy. Nobody else needs to die. Then Anton pulls a knife, they fight, Kenton kills Anton. So, Alon, just overall thoughts on this scene. Yeah, I didn't love this scene. (laughs) I thought it was kind of cheesy the way they were playing the music over it. And these two, neither of them felt, seemed particularly skilled at fighting, to be (laughs) honest. It just looked very amateur. And also, uh, another thing... Just in general, if you're worried that the other guy is going to try to kill you, just agree to what he's saying and then figure out a plan, Right. you know, for afterward, you know, kill him after. Don't like just haphazardly like pull a knife where anything could happen. Yeah, (laughs) I think both characters were just, I feel like everybody on this show has been so competent so far. It's one of my favorite aspects of the show. And in this scene, we see two people just acting so dumb. First off, did Kenton really think this was going to work? He thought he could just go to the Russian boss and say, come on, can we not do this? And <laughs> yeah, then Anton, I was hoping... No, Sorry. no, and the same thing you said. Anton thought he could just pull a knife and kill him right then and there. Yeah, and you know, these two, I, I seemed like they had more smarts. I was hoping to kind of see some sort of battle of wits between the two rather than just this quick knife fight. Yeah. Really bizarre. I mean, I like the moment he pulled the knife out, there was a second where I had a reaction of, Whoa, I thought that was kind of cool. And then the fight happened and it was also just confusing. It wasn't clear to me how Kenton actually killed Anton. To me, it looked like he was pulling on his arm or his hand. I can tell you. Okay, please. He he had his he, somehow he positioned his head like on a tire, and then he kind of like pushed his head and broke his neck 
on the tire. Oh, see, I, I rewatched yeah. it multiple times and I heard the cracking sound and then I saw Anton's mouth wide open and I just couldn't I couldn't see how he did it. Yeah. But okay. That's what I saw know. anyway. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, so, okay, overall, we didn't love the scene in the way it was executed, but it is pretty surprising because up until this point in the episode, I thought, okay, here's the thread we're going to follow now that Sergei is dead. We're going to follow Lily working for the Russians, and that's the plot. But not only does she say F you to the Russians, she puts up the sign, but even if she hadn't done that, it wouldn't have mattered because Anton is dead. So it feels like twice now Alex Garland has pulled this twist on us where he says, all right, so this show's about Sergey moving into devs. No, no, it's not. He's dead. But the show is actually about Lily working for the Russians. Nope, never mind. It's not about that. <laughs> so I love that he keeps pulling the rug out from under us and he just keeps us guessing. Yeah, and another thing... It's actually a good thing that Lily put up that FU sign in her window. Unknowingly, she's actually probably gaining Kenton's trust here. I have a feeling this will lead to her maybe having a similar role that Ser- Sergei, Sergei. Had, Sergei had, ending up in the box and discovering some secrets. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see because, yes, on one hand, she's gaining Kenton's trust to the extent that she is not going to work with the Russian government against Amaya. But at the same time, she is she is a problem because it's clear that she knows Sergei was a Russian spy. It's clear that she, at a minimum, suspects and strongly believes that he was murdered. So she's still a liability. So I don't know that she's out of the woods but it does seem like, I mean, Kenton could have killed her straight away. He didn't have to go to Anton first. So it seems like they're making the decision to keep her alive for now. Now, one thing I'm wondering is Kenton tried to appeal to Anton's emotions by, again, saying Lily does, she's in, she's innocent. She's not part of this. Do you think Kenton actually does believe that to a certain extent, that she is innocent he doesn't want her to die? Or was that purely a way to try and get Anton to agree to walk away? I mean, I, th- I think he believes she's innocent. I mean, it seems like he probably knew or, what Sergei was up to. So he probably would right. know at this point if well, I he think, had. No, I think he knows that on the facts she's innocent, that she didn't do anything wrong. But my question is, does he care? Emotionally, does he want her to live? Or is he indifferent and he'd be fine if he had to kill her? Yeah, I guess I don't understand enough about this world yet. Because from what I've heard from him and Forrest, it seems like he should not care about her. And the easier thing would be to just get rid of her. So I'm guessing there's something more to her that maybe he's aware of that we don't know that leads him to want to keep her around. Right. Maybe she fits into some bigger plan that's yet to be revealed. Or even if she wasn't part of the plan, maybe now they see some way that she can be useful. Right. So we'll see. Um, Doubling back a little bit to uh, Lily and Jamie, Jamie, her ex-boyfriend. One thing that I've harped on a few times is... This show injects emotion into everything, and I think it's great writing. So, for example, I think any other show where a character is trying to hack into a phone, they would have tried to create tension by, okay, the main character, she's a hacker. She's going to try and get into this phone. She's hacking. She's hacking. Oh, no, they're on to her. Is she going to get through? Boom, she hacked it. Here, I think Alex Garland realizes that that comes off as cheesy and fake, But at the same time, none of us as viewers know what it actually takes to hack a phone. So it's going to be very difficult to create tension by showing us the actual hacking process. So he says, how am I going to create tension here? How am I going to put an obstacle there? So he creates an emotional obstacle. He says that Lily can't hack the phone on her own. She needs help. And she has to go to her ex-boyfriend where there's all that baggage to get that help. So I think he does a great job 
of inserting emotional obstacles into this story to just get us more invested. And then the reveal itself holds a ton of emotional weight. The reveal is not just an interesting layer to the mystery. It is that. It's interesting that Sergei is a Russian spy. But on top of that, now she's got to deal with my boyfriend who I was in love with has been lying to me. And now I have to question everything. So just every step of the way, there's this emotional component to the show that I think works really well. And I like that Jamie ended up not being a total jerk. His reaction last episode when she went to him for help, I think was understandable. He was hurt by her. Why the hell would he want to help her? But as soon as he realized the gravity of the situation, her boyfriend lit himself on fire, boom, he drops that whole thing, he's willing to help. And, uh, and I appreciated that, and I thought that was, I liked that. I didn't want them to drag that out too much. What about you, Owen? What did yeah, you think I, of all the Lily Jamie stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I think he's being a, he's being a nice guy. I think uh, some percentage of it is, I think he's curious what's going on as well. Right. And like you want to know what was on the it, phone, right? And he's like, no, no, I, I don't care. I just want to make sure you're okay. He definitely <laughs> wants to know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I, I like the interactions between those two. Felt pretty realistic. I have a, I don't know. I I think at some point he's gonna try to get back with her. We'll see. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Not I think that, that that's uh, why we're watching this show. Yeah, <laughs> I think the homeless guy was right when he, uh, he keeps <laughs> accusing him of trying to get back with Lily. Do you think that homeless guy is uh, not what he seems? I think he's. So the first time we saw him. I thought he was Forrest because I knew from the commercials that Nick Offerman had long hair and you kind of see him from a distance. So maybe the homeless guy is Forrest from the future or an alternate reality. (laughs) But really, I think he's... I was going to ask you, is there more to him or is he just sort of comedic relief? I think it's the latter. I don't think there's anything more to this character but but you never know i hope it's just comedic relief i feel like it would be overkill that he turns (laughs) out to be some sort of spy or something yeah yeah agreed so the big question for me is where do we go from here it's not obvious to me what the next plot thread is i mean we know in the box the devs are working on something so that's obviously going to continue to develop but what does lily do now And if she's not going to work with the Russians, is she going to try and investigate what happened internally on her own, with maybe with Jamie's help? Is Kenton going to approach her and pull her in, like you were saying, maybe pull her into devs or somehow pull her into the grand plot here? I think she's going to pretend that she's accepted what they showed her happened to her boyfriend. And she's going to truly be trying to figure out the the hidden secrets while working for them. Right. I think you're right. And I also think Anton's dead, but it doesn't mean the Russians are out of the picture. Anton has a boss, probably. In the words of, uh, what's the name of the guy from Taken? Oh, Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson. <laughs> Liam Neeson. In the words <laughs> of Liam Neeson... In Star Wars Episode One: A Phantom Menace, there's always a bigger fish. So Anton may be dead, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure he's got a boss, and I'm sure the Russians are still going to play a role here. He's got and a wife may- and two kids. Maybe they'll uh, try to get revenge. Did you buy that sob story? I thought uh, that might be true, but he may have also been lying about that <laughs> just to try and convince her to join him. But if, if the Russians are still out there and they're going to continue to pursue this, they might try to get Lily on board again and say, look, I know you said F you, but think about it. Uh, so we'll see. A couple and of other random things. Kenton will kill that guy. Yeah, exactly. Though, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like he won that fight in this episode without any problems. So he came pretty close to He almost got stabbed. So. True. So we'll see. Uh, A couple of other random things. 
Uh, the statue. You and I were talking about that big statue. What is it? So a couple theories. Or really one theory. Um, first off, I'm surprised I didn't um, catch on to this in episode one. But there was a, a line that uh, I think her name is is Katie, right? The, the blonde girl that he works with. Mm-hmm. So Katie um, says to him, Something about uh, a parent losing a child and then apologizes and says that was clumsy. So as soon as she said that, I assumed, oh, Forrest has lost a child. So I should have put two and two together. That big statue, maybe that's his daughter. And he created the company in her name. And if all of this is about him trying to see his daughter or save his daughter, it would make sense that he would name the company after her and build a big statue of her as kind of the logo of the company. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, uh, I was looking at the IMDb, and the statue is actually credited. So there is a little girl out there who played that statue, and it was created in her likeness. And that girl, in real life, is named Amaya Mizuno Andre. So apparently they named the statue, they named the company after the actress who played the character, which was interesting. Nice find. Yeah. I wonder uh, if they would have... So were they just looking for a a specific look, I guess, and then whatever that person's name was, (laughs) that was going to be the name of the company? And also, funny enough, the person who interviewed Alex Garland about this show, where he talked about how he named the company after the actress... The person who interviewed him was also named Amaya. She worked for uh, Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> anyway, so any other thoughts on episode two of Devs before we wrap it up? I want to see more of uh, what's the guy's name? Stuart. Yeah, Stuart. <laughs> Good man. Hey, you know what? For all we know, Lily's done. We won't even see her again. It's all about Stuart from now on. I hope so. <laughs> nah, I like Lily. She's cool. Anyway, one of the one of the uh, just random thing, uh, I've complained before about Rotten Tomatoes and how they score television shows. Their whole system for scoring TV is completely messed up. Out of curiosity, I looked up the Rotten Tomatoes score for this show, Devs. The score is eighty three percent, and then I just looked up Legends of Tomorrow. The show on CW, I'm not going to say it's a terrible show, but it's definitely not a great show. And in no world is that show better than Devs. Devs has an 83%. Legends of Tomorrow has an 87%. So the whole Rotten Tomatoes system for television just just has no credibility. (laughs) What would you give it on Rotten Tomatoes? I would give it... I would give it the Legends of Tomorrow score, I think, 87, 87%, but that could go up or it could go down depending on how the rest of the series goes. Yeah, sounds about right. All right. <laughs> and by the way, this is being billed as a mini series. So I think a couple of times we've said the, this season, but it's a mini series. So presumably after these eight episodes, that's it. It's going to be one complete story, uh, but we'll see. Anyway, so loved episode one, really liked episode two, and excited for episode three. With that, let's wrap it up. Uh, Thanks for watching this video, and as always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever we do more videos like this one. You're especially going to want to do that because we're going to be recapping every episode of Devs. So make sure you're subscribed so you can see when we talk about episode three. Anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one take.